Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Susan Annenberg. I'm an associate professor at the George Washington. Oh, is that the camera? Yeah. Okay. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health and also a HACAS member. My pleasure to be here opening this um, first panel on extreme heat and health impacts. So i um, very glad to welcome you all here. And we have five excellent, yes, just counting here. Yes, five excellent speakers here today. Um, so we will start with Chris Uagio from Florida State University. And Chris, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Susan. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Okay. Um, so we are, uh, I'm actually presenting uh, Dr. Lei Chu Hu's work and, and Dr. Ki Li's work. So um, thanks for your patience with this as it goes along. Uh, given our setting, this we thought it was most appropriate actually to talk about Madison, Wisconsin, given that we had a study that uh, looked at it and it's actually one of our uh, HACAST partners, uh, Wisconsin Department of Health. So how do green space and blue space influence urban outdoor comfort? and their potential applications for the Earth observations. Next slide, please. Okay, might be a little <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. So the, oh, thanks. Okay, great. Thanks, so uh, <laughs> green spaces, as everyone knows, or many people know in the room, are really in vogue right now about their abilities to lower outdoor heat exposures. And we're, our team is most interested in human health, but obviously this, that applies to a variety of other things, um, worker productivity, uh, animal health, eco health as well. So obviously the, <laughs> the biggest contribution, just as a review, for cooling would be the evaporative uh, evaporative cooling um, from trees, really primarily being releasing the moisture. Uh, from a human health perspective, shading is going to be really important too for some outdoor workers. Less so in terms of the actual absolute temperatures that we're getting up towards the uh, um, air temperatures at two meter height, uh, and to a small degree reduce heat storage. And uh, what do we know about? Uh, Um, so on average, we know that about uh, green spaces, very different definitions and sizes, they cool our environments about a degree Celsius in the daytime. Uh, blue space uh, is a little bit more complicated to disentangle, uh, depending on the size of the water body, obviously. <laughs> You're going to have uh, perhaps uh, a lake breeze, uh, to put it mildly. That could lead to some minor daytime cooling, particularly if you're right near the, the, sh the shoreline, for lack of a better word. Um, in the evening time, you might have nighttime warming, warming, more heat capacity in the water, releasing it more slowly during the evening time. Uh, so really to get at uh, these interactions between blue spaces and green spaces, uh, Madison, Wisconsin was an ideal place to do that. Uh, as we were sort of hinting at, there's perhaps these more complex effects than more trees good for thermal comfort. There's also then during the daytime, there is a, a slightly, uh, an, there is still an effect from increasing the humidity then uh, for evaporative cooling, which from a human health perspective also has a slight penalty. So there, there actually is a little bit more that we have to disentangle. The story is a little bit more complex. Same thing with blue spaces. The timing of that is complex. For those of you who are familiar with Madison, their t-shirts say Lake City Lake, which, right? And so there's actually another lake or two there too, which sometimes they feel sad that they're emitted. <laughs> but it's a good place to, to look at blue spaces and green spaces impacts on thermal comfort. And more importantly, they have a long-term ecological research network that we can at least statistically uh, look at the relative contributions of these on local microclimates. So, so this uh, will already just be a recap more of what we've done historically and that and how, and how this can be expanded with Earth observations. So urban effects on temperature and humidity. This is the first the spatial pattern uh, on an average average over July for the day and the nighttime uh, for in the top for temperature versus moisture in the bottom. 
we still we can see here that in the nighttime, <coughs> um, the effects on on temperature are going to be more pronounced in the daytime. And we see sort of this inverse pattern on moisture versus the nighttime versus the daytime as well. So both uh, throughout the season and on average throughout uh, on spatially throughout the summer periods. So on average, what can we say uh, on average for green spaces have a beneficial of a stronger effect on lowering heat exposures, considering both temperature and moisture um, than blue spaces. Um, blue spaces warming, we can observe that. That's, as we mentioned, is going to vary based on the time of day, whether it's the daytime or the nighttime. Um, and spatially, that's going to as you'd expect, not extends to a super large area, but if you're you're near a water body within a half to even up to a kilometer from where that we can start to see some some effects on heat exposures. Uh, so just to transition to how what we're going to, to do with our project with our, or it's currently underway with New York City, really trying to combine them these denser networks of ground-based observations, fusing them as building off our previous talks with a variety of satellite sensor products, particularly EcoStress, which uh, uh, rides along the International Space Station and then goes to fill in more of the temporal or, or diurnal cycle at the bottom to really get at more, um, not just land surface temperatures, but also outdoor air temperatures, wh which were most consequential for human health. So in, in summary, green space is more effective at cooling, throughout the year, particularly at night. Uh, we do see uh, a bit of an impact of blue space on warming, particularly at night uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, these aren't really affected by heat waves. I didn't really emphasize that in these slides. Um, and then they can be downscaled and interpolated and infused going forward. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Fantastic. And um, maybe just uh, one or two clarifying questions. We're going to have a panel discussion at the end, but any questions for Chris? Uh, okay, sure. In terms of like generalizability, great, great question. Yeah, I think some places in the Midwest, like Minneapolis, between uh, Minneapolis areas that do have large, I wouldn't say small to moderate sized water bodies, uh, but even in places in the Southeast, whether they're um, human made or uh, natural or sinkhole or things like that, I think you can start to just, the point being that you still can and disentangle a bit of a, a blue space or um, ecosystem service benefit from them. Great question. Any other questions for Chris? Okay, great. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and we will now move on to our next presenter, um, who is, well, the, yeah. you're, no, uh, yes, you can be next. Yeah. <laughs> The order might be different, but the, no, certainly. Uh, this is Vijay Lamai from the Natural Resources Defense Council, someone whose work I have followed for many years. And um, the floor is yours, Vijay. Thank you, Susan. And thank you to the HACAST uh, organizing team. It's really an honor. I've been following HACAST for uh, a while, and it's great um, to be invited and, and get to meet all of you and hopefully share some, some of our work at NRDC. Um, so NRDC, for those of you who don't know, is the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, we're one of the oldest uh, environmental advocacy groups in the U.S., um, had a part in shaping the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and continue to work now 50 years in in helping to shape um, environmental and human health protections, both in the U.S., where I'll focus today, as well as internationally. Um, well, yeah, am I off the screen? Sorry. Oh, cool. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Um, all right. So today's talk, I'm going to kind of describe some heat focused work that we've been up to, but I think it'll have applications to air quality and maybe some of you also work on other climate hazards. Um, this talk is really about economic evaluation and kind of further application of heat health information in the US um, and, and welcome opportunities to chat about further applications with you all. Maybe I'll just have you click next. 
Awesome. Um, you know, so when we think about the costs of climate change, you know, I think over the past summer, we heard a ton in the media, right, about federal investments um, in climate action in terms of mitigating pollution from uh, the transportation sector, um, stationary sources, electricity generation, et cetera. We hear a lot less in the media about how ongoing intensifying climate change is imposing tremendous costs on the people of the United States, as well as, of course, internationally with inequitable impacts, of course, experienced in the global south. We can attach economic value to what we're seeing all around us in the headlines, right? Um, this is an example of what the US federal government, the folks uh, over at NOAA, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the folks that run the Weather Service, since 1980, they've been tracking the economic toll of the most expensive billion dollar disasters across the country. So we have, you know, a 40 year plus data set on damage to property, crops and infrastructure across the country. So this is a, an example from 2021 of the most expensive uh, climate and weather disasters. So it's just a, a quick caveat that not everything you see on this map, right? You see tornadoes, the winter storm, et cetera. There's various you know, levels of climate change attribution, um, but you'll see this if you kind of Google billion dollar disaster, you'll see this show up everywhere. The White House relies on this information to talk about climate damages. It shows up all, the, all over the you know, world in terms of insurance reports, et cetera. Um, but an important kind of missing piece of the puzzle here is that, you know, you can imagine that various climate hazards have all sorts of human health implications, right, including extreme heat. Um, but we're not really tallying the economic toll of the human health um, problems caused by climate change, right? And so that's really what this research is motivated at starting to develop methodology towards. Uh, next slide, please, Danny. Thanks. So, you know, we basically have these missing health costs that end up, you know, um, sort of biasing our estimates of current climate damages way downward. And when we think about intensifying climate change in the years to come, we're, of course, way underestimating um, how much it, it could cost if we continue kind of uh, along business as usual. Um, there's various reasons why health costs really haven't been prominent in economic assessments. Any of you who work in public health, I know we have DHS people from Wisconsin here today, know that public health tracking of climate change related problems is really not where it needs to be anywhere in the world, including in the US. Um, and so our challenge is really to articulate the kind of present day burden of climate change on public health, but also to signal where we're headed based on the best available science. And so that's really what NRDC has been working on for more than a decade. Um, Kim Knowlton, a senior scientist there, led a first study back in 2011. And then about eight years later, I came on board to help expand that work. Um, so on the next slide, you can just see kind of a summary. This is an open access study. I'm happy to send the PDF to any of you um, that came out about three years ago in GeoHealth. Um, this is our attempt to kind of build a methodology towards estimation of health related costs from climate sensitive hazards across the US. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of literature out there in terms of the public health burden of extreme heat, for example. Air pollution is uh, one of the better studied um, environmental health risks tied to climate change. Um, but we don't really have the synthesis happening, right, in terms of looking across all sorts of climate sensitive hazards. And we're talking about wildfires, infectious disease outbreaks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and climate change attribution to each of those issues is even further behind, right? So for a problem like extreme heat, I think now we can begin to start to articulate the climate, um, you know, increment related to those health problems, but we're way far behind on the other hazards. Um, so we have a lot of data challenges, a lot of methodology issues, and this work is really aimed at starting to offer a way to put all these pieces together when we're talking about climate, health, and economic information. Um, so on the next slide, you can just see a kind of visual depiction of what we did. Um, me and my team spent the better part of a year and a half gathering data from publicly available um, science. So, you know, peer-reviewed studies, data from state and local health departments, data from the federal government to understand the public health toll of each of these climate sensitive hazards. So, you know, big reports like the National Climate Assessment and IPCC report to, uh, about, you know, the various kind of risks associated with intensifying climate change when it comes to public health. We chose to look at a single year back in 2012 um, to try to estimate the cumulative public health toll as well as the economic burden associated with these events. This is the idea here is we can kind of build sort of a baseline understanding of how much these events are affecting human health um, and health related costs. And then, you know, over time revisit this method and start to build out a trend. Um, so I'm gonna focus on our home state extend Chris's focus on Wisconsin and also talk about a 2012 heat wave event that occurred here in early July. Um, on the next slide, 
you'll see uh, an example of the public health data that's currently available from the federal government. This is CDC's environmental public health tracking network data, um, freely available, publicly accessible, but you'll notice on the map, we've got pretty poor representation across the country, right? So this is you know, a map that I pulled up a few weeks ago, right? So a decade later, we still lack information across the country of heat related illness and deaths across the country, right? Um, and, you know, things are improving. CDC has developed a heat health tracker in the, in the last few years that's giving us much more kind of real time insight into, especially the hospitalization and emergency department burden of extreme heat. But suffice to say, we've got a pretty spotty picture. Um, nevertheless, I do want to give thanks to the state uh, health department folks here in Wisconsin who are, you know, one of the leaders in the environmental public health tracking network. So in the next slide, you can see um, just an example of some of that work led by Megan Christensen, um, a fellow lab mate of Chris and I here at Madison, um, who led a study who that really, you know, really deeply looked at the health burden of that week-long heat event um, in 2012 here in the state. Um, that was a period in which both high maximum, you know, record high maximum and minimum temperatures were observed, more than two dozen deaths and more than 1,600 um, uh, hospitalizations, I believe, or emergency department visits uh, together. So on the next slide, you'll see kind of how we think about health costs. Next slide, please, Jenny. Um, you know, so there are established methods, especially for premature mortality, when we think of, you know, how federal decision makers are con constructing, you know, regulatory impact assessments and thinking about the costs and benefits of federal policies. There's kind of established methodology for attaching economic value to um, loss of life. Um, but there's much less consensus on how to really do the math when it comes to the enormously expensive toll of healthcare in this country, right? Right now, we have about one in three American adults who report medical financial hardship. Um, that means that they're delaying or completely forgoing necessary care because they just can't afford it. There is data from the Agency for Healthcare and Research, uh, Healthcare Research and Quality out of CDC that keeps track of how much people are spending in the emergency room for a, a visit related to extreme heat stress, for example. So this project really, really was about integrating health information with um, the economic statistics available from the federal government. Um, on the next slide, you can see an example of kind of the data source problem that I mentioned. So here, you know, he depicted almost three dozen data sources that we had to integrate to come up with that, you know, pretty limited picture into what was happening in 2012. So even for one year, we're barely scratching the surface with the data here because we really right now, of course, lack a clearinghouse, a national kind of data set that allows us to pinpoint the health burden of climate sensitive hazards. Um, nevertheless, we did what we could. On the next slide, you'll see um, an estimation. I highlighted the, the extreme heat results because that's the focus of this brief talk, but you can see um, what we found for the other health hazards. Um, and so, you know, the idea here is that we're trying to synthesize available information using consistent ICD information, International Classification of Disease information, so that we can attach a specific health problem to economic costing um, using that federal health cost data. So in the next slide, you'll see the toll of uh, extreme heat in, in Wisconsin from that one event. You know, of course, it's dominated by the premature mortality statistic, more than $240 million, but another $5 million or so in um, those, you know, 1,000 plus hospitalizations um, and emergency department visits. And so it's this kind of costing that's really not part of our federal accounting when it comes to climate change. It's not part of our public discussion when we're talking about people displaced from a hurricane who need to seek out expensive medical care. Um, so we believe, you know, that we can start to kind of build a methodology. This is not the only way of doing it, of course. There's private health insurance data sets that we can take advantage of, for example. But we're trying to motivate more of a kind of momentum towards building the evidence base around this topic. Um, next slide. I'll just say that, you know, keeping up with the environmental health and epidemiology literature on this topic is also a big challenge, right? So this is just a sampling of studies including, you know, Rachel Licker, um, others at, at UCS, um, plenty of researchers. I'm sure many of you are represented in some of this work. We are learning more and more every day, right, about the toll of climate change on human health, not just from extreme heat, but from other hazards as well. And so the challenge is incorporating that epidemiology evidence into our um, economic costing models so that we can, we can really paint the full picture of what's happening across the country and make the case for stronger investments now that can people keep people out of harm's way. Um, I think the last slide I have is just a little um, kind of, you know, thinking about what to do next with this type of study. You know, we can talk about the 
relatively recent past, 2012. It's, it's I think, much more compelling to talk about real-time events that have happened in the last few months or, or years. Um, this is data from uh, campus here in, in Madison that's you know been doing projections of what climate change could look like across the state. We're trying to extrapolate from the relatively small evidence base that we have right now to talk about the future and make the case for you know aggressive action to address the climate problem from the, the mitigation and adaptation perspective and make the case that investments in you know adapt, adaptation when it comes to early warning systems, et cetera, can pay off um, economically as well. I think on the last slide, I just have a, a one more study I wanted to highlight in terms of this climate change attribution question, which comes up almost every time I give a talk like this and talking about how much of the extreme heat related health burden, for example, can actually be statistically you know, linked to climate warming. Um, if you click on the next slide, I think it'll show the, the key finding from the study that came out I think earlier this year um, or last year, um, pointing to you know more than a third of the burden of extreme heat related uh, mortality can actually be linked to climate warming globally. Um, we you know lack data in some really vulnerable areas like India, where I do a lot of work. But I think this is a really striking uh, study and an example of where we might be headed when it comes to attributing both health harms and economic burdens um, from the climate problem. I think I've used more than time than I was allowed, but I'll leave my contact information up here and happy to take questions. Um, maybe a few now, but maybe later. Book. Uh, thank you, Vijay. And uh, next, we are continuing along the Wisconsin theme. Um, you okay? We have Elena Andrechak and Maggie Thielen from the Wisconsin Department of Health. So very excited to have you here. I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Um, thanks for the brief introduction. As she said, my name is Elena Andrechak, and this is my colleague, Maggie Thielen, and we both work for the Wisconsin Division of Health Science health services. Um, I'm an epidemiologist for the Wisconsin Public Health Tracking Program, and Maggie is the manager for our climate and health program at DHS. So a quick overview on what we're going to be discussing today. Um, I'm going to be talking briefly about the NASA grant that we're involved in, um, as well as the mini grant program that our tracking program puts out annually. And then Maggie will be talking more about the surveillance that we do at DHS and related to health or heat stress illnesses and injuries, um, as well as our heat health warning system. So diving right into it, and I'm not going to go so much into detail here because we already saw a lot of information in the first presentation, which is related to this. Um, but the tracking program is involved in a NASA grant related to urban, urban heat islands. Um, so we're currently in year one of this four year grant so still kind of in the preliminary stages here, and this is part of a larger um, um, effort altogether with Haycast um, led by Tracy Holloway. Um, the focus here is we're collaborating with um, researchers from Florida State University and the University of Alabama in Huntsville, um, as well as um, colleagues in uh, the New York City tracking program, as well as the New York City Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Um, and the whole purpose of this is to explore um, herb, urban heat islands, both in New York City also and um, in urban areas in Wisconsin, including Wisconsin or Milwaukee and um, Madison. Um, so we did see a lot of uh, the data in our first presentation um, that's been related to this grant. And our colleagues are more focused on the actual analyses of these data, as well as exploring other newer sources of data, such as like 911 calls in Wisconsin. Um, and our role at the tracking program will be to help them disseminate these results throughout Wisconsin um, once the grant is complete. Um, Next, I'll just briefly talk about our mini grant program with the tracking program. Um, so um, part of our many responsibilities at the tracking program is we have been funding mini grants um, to up to eight local and tribal health departments throughout Wisconsin. And we've been doing this since 2015. The purpose of these mini grants is basically to, for, well, to encourage local and tribal health departments to use the data that we display and disseminate on our um, tracking portal website um, in order to make changes at the local and tribal le level in their communities. So we fund up to $10,000 per um, grantee or per awardee every year. Um, and they can use this money to identify projects um, at the community level and then use that money to make changes um, in their own communities. Um, so we do have 
several grantees who did do heat related projects um, over the past few years. Um, so I'm just going to be kind of going over some of these projects really briefly to give you an idea about what changes have been made at the local level um, using our tracking data. Um, so you don't really, you obviously don't need to read this, um, but we've had three grantees who focused on heat related projects and one grantee was in Grant County, um, where they actually collaborated with seven different agencies who they don't usually collaborate with um, to create an extreme heat communications plan. So in anticipation of these events becoming more common in the future, they now have this communications plan in effect um, so that when these events happen, hopefully they can respond and address them more effectively and efficiently. Um, we also had a grantee in Lincoln County who did some, da or some data analysis on their emergency room discharge data. Um, and they found actually an interesting finding where their highest rate of heat illness injury was actually among men aged 30 to 45 who were participating in more leisurely activities such as golfing during like actually more milder days in the summer. So like the mid eighties. Um, and this was a group that hadn't been on their radar before. So after being able to dive into that, into those data, um, they were able to develop a more targeted approach to addressing this community, developing messaging um, and outreach so that this community will be less at risk in the future for heat related illnesses. Um, and finally, just this past summer, we had Bayfield County, and they identified and equipped six different community centers as emergency cooling centers. Um, so I don't think that actually took effect this year, but I think in the next years to follow, um, in, in the event of extreme weather, especially in the summer, um, these uh, centers will be ready to go to shelter people um, who are in need of cooling during the summer. So that's a great project and potentially one that could save lives at the local level. So we were really excited to see that. All right, I'm going to briefly talk about surveillance before I hand it over to Maggie. Um, and we did see that kind of spotty national map um, that VJ displayed. So as he mentioned, the tracking program does contribute our data to um, that map. So that's part of what the tracking program does as we report emergency discharge and hospital discharge um, visits data to CDC to display on that national map. Um, I also receive heat related mortality data on a weekly basis in the summer from our Office of Health Informatics. Um, so that we can summarize those reports and kind of keep an eye on um, that kind of surveillance throughout the summer. Um, and finally, we're exploring different ways to uh, surveil for heat related illness, um, including using Essence, which is like a syndromic surveillance type of platform, um, so that hopefully we can identify and respond to um, heat events uh, quickly, more quickly in the future. Um, so now I'm just going to hand it over to Maggie. Thank you. And all of this data surveillance that we do uh, at the Department of Health Services, it really goes to inform a lot of our risk communication out to our partners. And they really appreciate having a lot of this data as background to re-emphasize safety and caution during these events. Uh, additional, you can ask, you can all see this, right? Uh, additional surveillance that we've been exploring within the climate and health program with uh, environmental public health tracking's assistance is looking, um, and with our occupational health uh, programs assistance, is looking at workers' compensation data. Uh, we just kind of preliminary ran some of uh, that survey, that um, that data query this uh, summer, and actually found. 300, uh, great, around 390 lost work time claims due to heat, re heat related illness data since 2018. And I believe the work time, uh, the, the workers comp claims, it results in at least three days of work lost there. And so that was a quite a, we thought we would only get a few of them in that query, but we were able, we're looking forward to exploring that data more with our occupational health uh, program partners. Uh, we also work a lot with our Office of Preparedness and Emergency Healthcare, who run our Wisconsin Ambulance Run Data System. So in combination with emergency department visits, discharge, all of that, we wanted to add another set of data around that hospital care cost calculation there. And we found um, since 2019, this is all even excluding a lot of the, the the drastic heat events that we had in 2012, greater than 5,000 related heat related illness ambulance runs. Uh, so I manage the climate and health program uh, within DHS, and this is funded by a CDC 
uh, climate ready states and cities readiness initiative uh, program. And uh, through this next round of funding, uh, we are exploring a heat health warning system because being able to inform decisions and uh, alert those at-risk populations is a, is a really good way to prevent that heat-related illness. So this is pretty complicated for, for me, a public health professional, but you guys probably know this a little bit better, know some of the terminology here. So we are um, collaborating with National Weather Service, local government, uh, sustainability programs, a few UW researchers through a, uh, the Wisconsin Heat Health Network to develop this system. So uh, we're hoping that the system will be able to provide uh, guidance to partners on these warnings and advisories. And then along with this, really explore some of that risk communication um, practices. So the system is different than what the National Weather Service uses for their heat advisories and heat warnings, just as to preface this. So we're looking at forecast data that comes in, so temperature, humidity, dew point, et cetera, all of those lovely fun data points. Uh, then you, we look at the, the air mass type that is involved, the spatial synoptic class. So the different dry polar, dry moderate, dry tropical. From there, uh, we're able to identify that weather type as either not offensive or offensive. And this was all done uh, with researchers down in Florida, uh, looking at all cause mortality along with those days of the, the different types of uh, air masses. So when the air mass is uh, declared offensive, different uh, forecast algorithms, a very long formula that I am not very <laughs> fluent in, uh, with that algorithm, we're able to have that prediction of excess mortality based on um, excess heat factor. So yeah, like I said, based on all cause mortality analysis uh, through an excess heat factor through the Nairn Fawcett method. From there, uh, so the national weather system will make that kind of determination for watches and warnings. So we're using, we want the system to be, be used to nudge the national weather service. They have their own protocols. They have their own procedures. We don't want to duplicate them. We want them to make, have more informed decisions. So then National Weather Service can communicate to decision makers in southeastern Wisconsin because the system is right now only for Milwaukee and Madison. Uh, they can communicate during extreme heat events and just pride situational awareness and again that risk communication talking points. And we're very much in the beginning process of this implementation. So um, it's the system is used in a couple other cities around the country and around the world. So we're trying to evaluate this to see how this works in Wisconsin, if it will work in Wisconsin. So, yeah. Thank you. Hey, our question's coming for you too during the panel. <laughs> okay, fantastic. And last but certainly not least, we have Leticia Noguera from American Cancer Society. Leticia, what is your Wisconsin, Wisconsin connection? <laughs> <I'm> here. <laughs> You're here. Okay, that's, that's connection enough. So the floor is yours, Leticia. Oh, do I have the... Okay. Good morning, everybody. My name is Leticia Nogueira. I'm a researcher at the American Cancer Society. I currently live in Florida, not in Wisconsin, but I hope that uh, this public health perspective is still very useful to the work that all of you do. So climate change is the greatest threat to human health of our time. You've all heard that sentence, but sometimes when we hear this, we think about uh, rising sea levels. I live in Florida now, it's also a threat or vector-borne diseases in faraway countries. But I really wanted to show you how climate change is a health threat right here, right now. It's already impacting the health of individuals in this country today. And I think that one of the easiest ways to show this is looking at heat. I think that we are all getting tired of hearing that the temperature today is the highest it has ever been in history, a feeling that now has a name, broken record, record-breaking. 
when you're tired of hearing about all of the impacts of climate change, you stop paying attention and I beg you don't stop paying attention. There's nothing normal about NOAA's climate normals lately. The temperatures keep increasing and this is going to continue to have health consequences for all of us. And heat waves are deadly. So extreme heat is the leading, leading cause of uh, weather related deaths in the United States. Uh, you might not be able to see, but the uh, columns in the middle there are showing the number of deaths in 2021 there due to heat that had uh, extreme heat exposure mentioned in the death certificate. That's one way to calculate number of deaths due to heat. Another way is to calculate excess number of deaths which you calculate how many deaths were expected to happen around that time, and then how many more deaths happened. And this is showing uh, the excess deaths in Washington during the heat wave there last year. And then the number is even greater. And of course, death is just the most extreme health impact of heat. There are other types of health impacts. Uh, and exposure to extreme heat can worsen existing medical problems. It also leads to worse air quality with several cardiovascular uh, uh, consequences. And the uh, farther down you go in that triangle of the not so severe health impacts, the larger the number of people who are going to suffer the consequences of exposure to extreme heat. And how do we measure that? I think Vijay talked a little bit about that uh, from an economic impact, but also from a public health impact. The first question here is how do we define a heat wave? If the temperature continues to increase and we're constantly measuring it by uh, an an exceedance over the average, but the average continues to increase. How much can our bodies really uh, adapt to increasing heat? What kind of increased temperature at what part of the uh, summer? Because earlier in the summer, we we're less used to heat versus later in the summer is really uh, health significant. One way to do this is look at the uh, percentile of temperatures in the past years, and then you can use the 95th percentile, the 99th percentile of the maximal temperature during the day. Another way is to look at uh, abnormally hot nights, so the minimal temperature during the night, which has severe health consequences because that's when our body recovers. And especially in areas that don't have access to air conditioning, high nightly temperatures are very significant for health. And we know that not every uh, neighborhood or every person is impacted in the same way. I think that we, we heard a little bit about the green versus blue and how in urban centers, because of all of the pavement and concrete, you create these urban heat islands. So people living in urban areas are uh, exposed to heat at a, a more frequently. And also those that live, and we talked about this in the last meeting on the environmental justice issue, in, uh, areas that have less access to green spaces or previously redlined neighborhood, redlining being the government sponsored institutional racist practice of using racial composition and evaluating risk uh, of uh, mortgage lending in neighborhoods in the 1930s. Those neighborhoods until today, you will see will, are impacted by heat uh, more frequently and at uh, higher temperatures. So even if you have access to air conditioning, and some of us might have access or have air conditioning installed in our homes, but not be able to use it during a heat wave because of um, energy costs or even because your utilities have been cut. And even if you have access and you can't afford it, whenever there is a heat wave, everybody is uh, putting a, a strain on the electrical grid, on the power grid, because everybody's using their air conditioning more, which leads to blackout. There's been a doubling in the number of blackouts in the United States between 2015 and 2020. So if the power goes out in the entire city and your cooling centers don't have access to backup generators, then what? This study was evaluating the uh, in, inside of the buildings, the um, indoor temperature uh, modeling in three different cities. And the top three figures are with the power on and the bottom three is without power. So if there's an overlap of a heat wave and a blackout, what are the health consequences then? So this is the type of overlapping conditions. Um, there are compounding risks between the three pillars of vulnerability. The first one being exposure. So this is what we talked a little bit about the urban heat islands, where you're more likely to be exposed to heat. Your sensitivity, which is an uh, especially important one for us at the American Cancer Society, because people who have been diagnosed with cancer due to their cancer diagnosis, 
and the health consequences of cancer treatment. Some chemotherapy agents uh, lead to um, uh, less ability to thermoregulate, so you're more sensitive to heat waves. So, and other chronic health conditions as well will make you more sensitive to heat waves. And then your adaptive capacity. Do you have access to air conditioning? Are you able to turn it on? Are you able to access a cooling center? It is those three pillars combined and the overlapping hazards that really need to inform not only our adaptation strategies, but also our mitigation strategies because it all goes back to climate change. And that is how we're going to evaluate the areas that have increased risk and the special characteristics of each one of those areas they're going to inform our strategies. And this is where satellite data can really help us. And we've been working on identifying those areas. That's it, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Leticia. Any, um, well, I guess we will just now invite all the panelists to come back up here. Um, the chair in the middle is the special tall one, so. <laughs> Whoever feels like they want to have a commanding presence, choose that one. Um, and please get your wheels turning for questions for our awesome panelists here. Um, we have about half an hour, so um, we have quite a lot that we can we can discuss here today. So um, I will ask a first question. It looks like we have microphones here, and maybe I'll give you the mic this microphone in the middle so you don't have to awkwardly lean. Um, but let me ask my question first, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and I was um, I was typing notes on my phone as you were talking, so let me, uh, okay, great. So um, I wanted to ask a question first for the, um, the sort of action stakeholders in the crowd. Um, you talked about providing early warning systems and um, information systems to stakeholders. What are the types of actions that you anticipate um, people doing with that information, both in the short run, you know, maybe like a, a you know, a, a day in advance, um, and in the long run, maybe for long term, long term planning. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, our main messages that go out through the both the Department of Health Services as well as the local public health partners. We want them to be able to take action. We want them to be able to have the resources available to communicate the need for people to check on their neighbors, to be able to uh, prepare ahead of time for these different heat related events, uh, to make sure they have their medications in place. If there is that, uh, that cross cutting aspect of, of these impacts with the blackouts, making sure that there are plans in place, generators in place. We want them to be able to take that action. Yeah, I totally agree. I think um, one area that NRDC is working on is um, pushing OSHA, um, Occupational Health and Safety, at the federal level to establish, you know, it's they're beginning the probably years long process of strengthening heat health protections in the workplace. Um, we know that it's not just agricultural workers, right? It's people working in Amazon fulfillment centers. It's UPS drivers who this past summer, um, you know, made some waves in, in complaining about 100 degree plus temps in their non-AC vehicles, right? So um, yeah, in addition, I think to the interventions in people's daily lives and getting Americans, especially to recognize heat as not just some inconvenience that you can deal with with AC if you can afford it. But a real health threat, um, and recognizing that it's you know it's about teachers, it's all sorts of occupations. It's hard to think of, um, you know, just um, one setting where occupational protections are needed. I think that just from the perspective of vulnerable populations and sensitive populations, working with cancer centers and cancer providers and other, um, I think that there's a lot with uh, chronic kidney disease that can be done as well to communicate with the individuals that they are at higher risk of exposure to heat and how to deal with it, to register for special needs shelters during these events and to be prepared and sign up. Uh, for some of these warnings that are not necessarily uh, distributed equally so that they can prepare accordingly when, when there is a heat event. One thing that just um, strikes me, I'm trying to get into the camera here. Okay. <laughs> One thing that just strikes me after um, hearing you guys uh, answer is 
um, that there's there's such a wide range of of um, people and organizations that can use this information. We heard federal agencies, we have local and state agencies, we have individuals, we have maybe medical practices and clinics. Um, and so there's really a large number of potential users for this information. Um, and uh, Chris, I wanted to ask you, maybe the others have um, thoughts as well, but uh, um, as people start to put into place measures to inform all of these different partners, all these different stakeholders about the um, heat health risks, what can we observe from satellites? Is it possible to observe the benefits of interventions from space? Yeah, great question, Susan. So yeah, we're trying to start, I think this is sort of an area where ACAST is, is really trying to meet sort of a user need or perceived user need. Um, cities are literally spending billions of dollars in green infrastructure, other nature-based solutions. Uh, at the moment, there are a couple of cities, Chicago, New York City, that have Internet of Things, distributed network sensors that are able to maybe uh, evaluate to some degree to what extent these are cooling the air temperatures uh, for their community. Uh, but that leaves a lot of the nation in the world that doesn't have that capability. And so we are working with New York City to uh, see post-Hurricane Sandy, where they have spent a billion dollars on tree planting. Can we detect that from space? Can we disentangle that? And I think we think we can, preliminary results can. Uh, ideally, that still needs more scalable workflows and things like that to translate that to other cities and locations. We also have the, the microphones at the table, so feel free to use them. Um, okay, questions to the audience, yes. And uh, whoever responds, can you please repeat the question first? Let me see if I get the question correctly. Uh, you're wondering about the inverse of that and ground truthing um, local data with the satellite imagery and combining it all, right? I was going to answer a different part of it. <laughs> start there. We'll yeah, start yeah. With the start there. Going again. <laughs> uh, uh, based on what Tracy was saying uh, previously, uh, I know the Climate and Health Program in Wisconsin is is super interested in that ground ground truthing and to looking at the local data. Um, not specifically for extreme heat, but related, we're looking at air quality data in Milwaukee. And I'm all during that initial presentation on that satellite data, I'm like, how can we combine that ground, the, that ground sampling, air sampling with um, some of the satellite imagery? And I don't know how it's done, but it's just a little note in my notebook. And uh, I am going to follow up on that one. But as for the other question, does somebody... Sure. Is there the question in terms of linking it to health outcomes? Like if, if, if it's, is it salient that uh, someone dies uh, in a neighborhood with a higher urban heat island effect? Is that a re an okay restatement? Maybe not. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think um, one of the complications, I think, yeah, there might be value to, you know, kind of looking back and understanding what the particular like heat profile looked like in a in a health event. Um, one of the complications, of course, is that you have people with pre-existing conditions, you have people in social isolation, you have, you know, all sorts of other confounders that are tricky to get a handle on when we, we can barely get a handle on heat on the death certificate, right? So if we look at death certificate data, which you saw earlier, um, that's just a, you know, scratching the surface probably. So um, I think 
you know, and then the state health department folks can talk about, you know, personally identifiable information and the complexities of getting in really deep with that level of individual level data. So I think it's a, it's a worthy cause, but really complicated by the data. Yeah, I mean, the mortality data that we see at the state level is, like you said, like pretty sparse and what we like, especially when it comes to like an XY coordinate, we probably wouldn't have access to something like that. Um, potentially, you could follow up with cases like that because there aren't very many, like luckily throughout the year. So if you wanted to do more in depth project, you could probably request more detailed information. But from what we see typically, like on a weekly basis in the summer, it's not very detailed at all. Um, but I mean, in terms of modeling, like who might be more at risk aside from the spatial um, aspects of things, like you could potentially look into comorbidities and how that might affect your risk for heat related illness, or even like your occupation or your demographics, things like that. So unfortunately, like the spatial thing would be kind of a hard thing to analyze with the data that we see, um, except for maybe by a case by case basis, but there are other opportunities to explore that data. Um, in a little bit, in a more of a modeling way. I'll just try to restate the question. It's a great one, um, which is about exposure and metrics. Um, we have nighttime temperature, we have daytime temperature, we have differences between nighttime and daytime, um, and different studies use different different things. Um, which ones are the most appropriate ones to be using? Um, is there any kind of consistency across the the field, and which might be most connected to the health outcomes? Yeah, that that is a, a very good question and, and one that we don't have like a consistent answer, right? And I think it depends on the population that you're interested in. So if you're uh, looking at uh, OSHA and uh, um, occupational exposure, will probably be your daily high for outdoor workers. If you're looking at cancer patients who are, you know, sensitive to temperature and are trying to recover and, and you're looking at access to air conditioning, it would probably be your nighttime low because if your nighttime low is abnormally hot and people are not having that time for their bodies to recover. So it, it, it is not a straightforward, you know, pick this one, it will depend on your research question. And um, this is probably one of the reasons why there is no straightforward definition of a heat wave yet. Um, sure, just briefly, um, there have been some intercomparison studies with population built, population aggregated, sorry, health counts, for example. And in general, they're pretty similar. Um, temperature explains about half of the variability of all the other metrics, just using temperature. If I had to choose two, temperature and moisture. If you're an outdoor worker, light bulb globe temperature, temperature, moisture, humidity, and wind. Is that like a daily average? Um, it depends on the resolution of your health information and then right getting towards the sensitivities there's sort of a daily cycle if you will depending on your location of of when you expect to see more heart attacks or more uh, asthma exacerbations or so it's probably it, it does vary by health outcome if, if i could just add a, a, a follow-on question to that is um what do the satellite data provide in terms of metrics are they um do they have enough temporal resolution to get at daytime and nighttime. Can we see nighttime temperature? Um, you know, uh, do we need to average over longer periods of time to, uh, who was it on the last panel that said beat down the noise? I think that was Arlene. Um, any thoughts about what is observable via satellites? Um, um, Sure, great question. So yes, I think when I work with stakeholders, so for example, Miami-Dade County has the world's first chief heat resilience officer, um, chief heat resilience officer, Jane Gilbert. Uh, yeah, that was one of the first questions. So we looked at uh, just for MODIS, I wouldn't say quick and dirty, but a 20 year average of, of summertime day versus nighttime. 
Uh, and just to see if it if it is, do you have an enhanced risk based depending on your metrics? And we stratified it by a severity of health outcome. Um, so yeah, I think nighttime setna, um, sorry, <laughs> NASA data can help provide insight in that sort of question in a way that other uh, federal Earth-based observations cannot. Uh, blending that further with uh, their observational networks, very similar to air quality. There are these sort of low cost sensor networks, same sort of issues, standardization and where people place them. Um, but that the combination of those two, I think can provide uh, a lot more information um, spatially and temporally. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Great question. I'll try to restate it um, for the for the people in the virtual room. Um, what's the level of detail that we need spatially and temporally to provide valuable information to a variety of different um, types of organizations to plan actions that they can take to mitigate uh, heat impacts? Um, the, I think the question was talking about long-term timeframes, 2030s, 2040s, but if you want to answer the question for the more near term as well, that would be that's good. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, sure. Great question. So I guess I'll think I'll maybe give an example of New York City, uh, Con Ed, um, sort of a public private electrical company partnership. And they point to one of their successes in New York City's health department as um, having a seat at the table with them and expanding capacity for electrical gener sub generate. So I'm not a, clearly a power person, but well, an expert capacity in the grid in their most at risk neighborhoods, or at least the substations that serve them. That uh, that there's more than the needs, more redundancy there for a period like an extreme heat event. So that I think that uh, so on one level, sort of the borough or or that sub district level. On another level, for other just running with New York City or Wisconsin in this case, the be, checking on your neighbors, uh, sort of be a buddy program. Knowing unfortunately, like that household or individual level is a, is unfortunately sort of where a lot of this is going. And it's yes, it's outdoor temperature, but really how that translates to indoor for a lot of these people. Now since um, most of the people spend 90% of their time indoors. Um, so yeah, both of those could be helpful. We're talking a lot about like that, those urban areas too. And I think we, it's, it's worthwhile to mention with the, the, just the person to person kind of interventions with rural populations, that's a whole different um, process there and being able, and they might not have neighbors to be able to check on them. So trying to figure out those kind of different interventions that work in rural areas is a, um, a challenge. And this is where some of those early warning systems, either through uh, National Weather Service or through a different program, uh, maybe through UW Extension or something a local there is super beneficial and helpful. Yes, another question. Yeah, it's kind of a comment that it, it coupled this question, and that is throughout much of the United States, we're running into problems with water available. So, Chris, you talked about green space have that in here at school of the year. Um, I've got a bunch of 50 year old palm trees on my lease that just died of the lack of water. So, in the past, that's been a refuge of shade as well as cool and low. It's no longer there. And as we look at some of these northern cities, such as in Wisconsin or Washington State, that's another thing with heat outbreaks, we're, we're going to see more and more air conditioning coming into people's houses. 
Just, uh, thank you. Great question. Re restating it. Hopefully I'm not uh, butchering it, but um, a lot of the interventions that can be put in place for heat are also would have other um, impacts or benefits. Uh, we heard about drought and water issues that are affecting a lot of the United States right now. Um, and of course, uh, heat and water availability go together in many, many ways. Um, how much are, and I was actually like, as the panelists were uh, presenting, I was wondering and concocting a question myself about cumulative impacts on the population too, because we know that heat doesn't just exist in um, isolation. It's not the only um, hazard that people are experiencing at any given moment. Um, so how much is this sort of uh, uh, system-wide um, effect of interventions or the hazards already being accounted for in either research or in the action that uh, people are planning. <laughs> That's a wow. It's a tough question. Um, you know, in terms of how far along are we in understanding this, like systems, um, these systems effects, the cumulative impacts. I think um, you know, when it comes to like the environmental health world, um, we're getting a better understanding of the ways in which you know extreme heat and and air pollution interact um, so that there's this, you know, synergistic effects for certain pollutants where the sum is greater than the parts. Um, but I think we're much further behind when it comes to like operational um, thinking and connecting, you know, drought, water availability, power plant function, air quality, and all the rest as we have a shifting baseline. Um, so, you know, we, uh, Tracy and, and Jonathan Pats here and, and a, a team led a study a few years back trying to look into the future in terms of like the air quality implications of AC demand from from extra heat, but that study did not, you know, incorporate the type of thinking you're talking about in terms of like in the Pacific Northwest where we have low AC penetration, how much extra demand are we going to see in places like that? So um, I think it's, it's a big challenge to incorporate that shifting baseline and new thinking around, you know, expansion of AC. And just a quick point about the urban heat island there, it's probably regionally there's been a couple of studies, so for, particularly more in drier climates. So for one in Phoenix, uh, the actual amount of anthropogenic heat sources are about, a, it heats the outdoor air temperature about a degree Celsius as well during the summertime. So not, not minimal either. But. Another question here? Great question. Um, the I'll restate it, which is about vulnerable populations, recognizing that some of the actions that people can implement in the near term um, cannot cannot actually be available to some people in our communities, um, outdoor workers who may not be able to take time off work, uh, people who uh, may not be able to visit a cooling center. Um, what are the actions that can be taken to transform our built environment uh, so that everyone has access to a comfortable temperature and we can mitigate the health uh, impacts for everyone. Yeah, that's a, that's a question I think about daily in the work that we do uh, because cancer patients are such a vulnerable population. Um, and I would say all of the above. There are things that each one of us can do at the local level, at the regional level, at the state level, at the federal level, there are um, going to be impactful. And they can be about communicating with your patients about their heat risks. It can be checking on your neighbor as has been mentioned here. It can be uh, 
using your research to improve the background knowledge that is then used to support EPA or the uh, uh, Clean Air Act. Um, I think that the answer that our research team, team at the American Cancer Society is getting to is recognize your sphere of influence. And it's going to be different to each one of us. Where is it that each one of us can do just one more push so that more people have access to the infrastructure and that we're all understanding how this is not impacting this one person over there. All of us have some level of vulnerability and all of us are going to be impacted in some way. And all of us have at least a little bit of power to make a difference in one level. So I think that this question I, I bring back to all everybody in the room, what is it that each one of us can do to push it just one step forward at, at which level that will make a difference to people around us? Uh, I also uh, want to talk, maybe not the built environment, but the importance of having a whole community approach into these comprehensive planning for these events. Uh, I'm probably thinking more along the emergency management line, uh, but being able to have that input from those at-risk communities and have input from the trusted communities that they interact with into these type of uh, uh, response plans is super valuable because they those trusted organizations will know how to reach their uh, their community and be able to take action during these extreme events. Yeah, I think your question is you know one of like prioritization. I think too, um, in addition to you know doing as much as we can, I think one of the aims of some of the work that you know I showed you today is to try to translate. Um, the costing of health problems from extreme heat and flip the script a little bit and talk about the economic savings of different interventions and begin to provide an evidence base to try to prioritize. So you could tell, you know, a mayor, if you spend a dollar on XYZ intervention, here's the expected payoff from a health perspective. Um, we're a long way from being able to offer that type of information, but that's the idea that we could begin to fill in that, that cost benefit information. I mean, we, we've seen during COVID, right, that um, just explaining the health benefits of something is probably not going to get, you know, the type of action that we want to see. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. Great question. Um, it was about another aspect of vulnerable populations, people experiencing homelessness who are often the first impacted, and maybe the most severely impacted. Um, what actions can we take to protect this community? So we are currently working with HUD, the Housing and Urban Development, on trying to identify. And then again, there's a similarly to the health uh, data gap, there is a housing data gap in which you only really get information for the, the people that received HUD assistance, not those that were waitlisted. So you, you know, it is kind of hard to evaluate the impact of those who are um, experiencing homelessness. But you're right, it is a, a severe vulnerability. And another one that demonstrates the compounding hazards, um, if you, and one of the most urgent ones, right? If you don't have housing, anything else really, employment, uh, healthy food, housing is the very first one. So I think that, again, it's recognizing how can our research just um, improve understanding or, or any of our actions of how important housing, access to safe and, and secure housing is because it is going to impact so many different health outcomes and protect from so many different environmental hazards. Sure, the in-house are like by definition hard to count. So the, the um, it depends on the location. They was, oftentimes will have point in time surveys. The census even does a point in time one that's in the ACS, which isn't uh, super reliable, but is a starting point. Um, yeah, and then sort of Phoenix is probably the poster child where we're seeing the highest death rates due to heat in the nation in a place that has you know 98, 99% AC saturation, largely due to the in-house and the combination of uh, if you're uh, opioids, fentanyl, other drug, illicit drug use. A great question. Um, I think 
great reminder that environmental hazards do not exist in isolation and we have to consider the systemic issues that are still affecting all of us. So um, big round of applause to our panel and to all of our audience members.